Uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Rainville, uh, introduced by our distinguished colleague uh, from the state of Vermont, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm grateful to you and to uh, Ranking Member uh, Micah for inviting a real Vermonter uh, to have a chance to speak to you. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you're going to hear from Brian Rainville, lives on a family farm, three generations, that's right on the Canadian border, and he's going to tell you how a project is impacting his farm. Uh, but the primary goals of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act are to create quality jobs for Americans and revive our economy. But equally important, we want that money to invest in recovery that has lasting benefit uh, without, having, uh, without doing damage along the way. Not every project falls into that category. And I think this committee is demonstrating that it's open to listening and learning when a recovery project uh, may have some questionable uh, impact. So I want to thank you uh, and the committee on both sides of the aisle for inviting a Vermonter here, Brian Rainville, uh, to share his story of how this project will impact uh, his family, his family farm, and our community. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, we want to hear the, uh, the good news. We also want to hear uh, those things that didn't go so well or that were... Uh, uh, that just didn't work out at all. And uh, that's the purpose of having hearings. As I said, this is the 19th in our series of oversight and accountability and transparency hearings, uh, during which we've, uh, we uh, heard this, the difficulties that EPA had in early going and implementing its portion because there were some quirks in the law that made it difficult for them and many other such uh, circumstances. And they're all lessons for the future as we go through our authorization bill and the other legislation under the jurisdiction of this committee. So, Mr. Rainville, welcome. You have our full attention. Thank you. Um, it's a, a pretty amazing opportunity today for a child and grandchild and great-grandchild of dairy farmers to be here. Um, I live at Morse's Line, which has uh, three houses and one border port. And we've run into a little problem. Instead of looking at need, we have an agency focusing on want. What they want to do is spend money. What they need to do is leave us alone. In 1983, they identified the port at Morse's Line for closure. They said the traffic volume is low. The geographical proximity to other ports, 10 miles west, 10 miles west there's one, 10 miles east there's another. There's a duplication of services. Somehow, Morse's line became a critical port facility in lieu of the stimulus bill. We're a little confused. We have a traffic rate of two and a half cars an hour. It's closed for eight hours of every day. At midnight, the gates put down, the sensors are turned on, and the hardworking men and women of the Border Patrol go to work. So we're trying to figure out why this agency is using eminent domain as a battering ram to work its way onto our farm. And the only conclusion that we can draw is if they don't spend the money by the 30th of September, they lose it. In testimony this morning, I heard from someone sitting, I think, at this very microphone and said, well, that's our protocol. I'm sorry, this is my parents' livelihood. And I believe that carries more weight. I believe stimulus funds should be administered in the same way that medicine is practiced. First, do no harm. Our community was not consulted. We asked for a public meeting and we were told that the agency was reaching out to the Morris's Line community, by, when, by which they met my parents, my brothers and I sitting around our kitchen table. A public hearing was finally held last Saturday and I was thankful tar and feathers were nowhere in the room because had they been available, 18th century methods would have been applied to well-meaning people who were trying to do their jobs. But they never took the step back and asked a fundamental question, what does Morse's line need? And a facility designed in 1936 for a different time and place isn't necessarily relevant in 2010. My family asked representatives very early on, how are you justifying this project? And they said, we have the money. I have never heard that argument before. 
I spent 10 years planning the renovation of my farmhouse. My brother worked for two years to plan a 20-foot addition to our sugar house. We had a group of people who came in and told us they were going to do a 12-month feasibility study. And we found out four months later that they had designed and were putting to bid a $15.4 million facility. Again, the gap is there. What do they need versus what do they want? My family said clearly, this is vital cropland. Their environmental assessment said this is a vacant lot. Rather than weigh the loss against our farm, they compared all our acreage to all the acreage in Franklin County. They talk in the environmental report about the most affected businesses. They talk about the dollar store and Stairs Unlimited. Those aren't even in our community. At Saturday's public meeting, a young woman stood up and said, I don't understand your report because you drew a conclusion and then you twisted your data to get there. Retired custom officers who, because they're now collecting pensions instead of wages and have an opportunity to speak about this very project, stood up and called their own agency on the carpet and said, we know you wanted to close this in 1983. We know your moratorium report from last fall identifies precisely this type of port for closure. But the project moves on, so much so that a mere 12 days or so remain to a 60-day period in which Customs and Border Protection told my family that if we didn't sell our property voluntarily, they would take it. As someone who's taught civics for the last 16 years and explained to my students that this is a responsive government, a government that cares about rights, a government that protects property, I have had increasingly increasing difficulty trying to explain to well-meaning people who want to spend money why they should leave my family alone. We have a national register property. It's a dairy of distinction. In 1981, this Congress wrote legislation forbidding federal agencies to unnecessarily convert prime agricultural soils. But there's money to be spent, and the project moves forward. I find myself every time I see representatives using smaller words and shorter sentences to make the same point. And I run out of patience. And I ask this committee today to reprimand that agency. There is no public good at Morse's line. There is no reason to spend money at Morse's line when they know that a gate and censors and the border patrol keep this nation safe. And to have veiled this project under economic stimulus and eminent domain and national security is reprehensible in a democratic nation. I am incredibly thankful to the Vermont congressional delegation which asked questions consistently and got us answers and secured a public meeting just last Saturday. But I am out of patience with an agency that refused to give us the traffic count. My father asked at the first meeting, how many vehicles come through Morse's line in a year? And they told us, we'll find out and we'll get back to you. And we asked, and we asked again, and we asked again. We shouldn't have had to file a Freedom of Information request to get that information. If this was a necessary project, the agency would have voluntarily given us that. And the mere fact that I'm the only person talking about this project in front of a microphone tells me this agency knows they have done wrong. They owe this committee an apology for the misuse of stimulus funds. They owe my family an apology for the manner in which they have treated us. They didn't give us the environmental report. We found out after it had been available for eight days and we were already 30 days into a public comment period. And just last Saturday, they walked into our town hall where government 
local government representatives have been asked hard questions for more than a hundred years and they tried the same dog and pony show. And when their laptop crashed, taking down their presentation, explaining that this new facility would make us all safer and they had superior technology, I had to believe that karma was at work. I am out of patience with an agency that says a public need is to spend money. We accommodated a hydro line, major transmission line into the state of Vermont because it was for the public good. We accommodated reconstruction of Route 235 because it was for the public good. The public good is not the spending of stimulus monies. Thank you for your heartfelt, uh, impassioned uh, testimony. Uh, I uh, would uh, observe, however, uh, your last paragraph saying, I return to Vermont with hopes of once again being a teacher rather than the lesson. I think you go back being both. Thank you. Thank you. There's a provision of the Constitution which I refer to quite uh, regularly, and that is uh, the right of the citizens to petition their government for redress of grievances. That's the lesson. Thank you. Uh, and the, the sequel to the lesson is that I think we'll be able to stop this. I will uh, send to Secretary Napolitano this portion of the transcript of the hearing. Thank you. Uh, with a, re, uh, with, with uh, a recommendation that the project be withdrawn, that the uh, funds be uh, deflected to some other beneficial pursuit and reference the participation of Congressman Welsh, who may join me in the letter if he, if he wishes, but uh, I will most certainly send that letter and make very strong representations to Secretary Napolitano. I'll further say that, uh, notice your observation uh, of uh, a mere 80 cows, that used to be a pretty good-sized milking herd, at least in my district. Uh, and one had 80 cows fresh and another 80 or so, 100 uh, waiting. And uh, uh, what, uh, what's your uh, pounds per, per uh, cow over a year? What, oh what are you milking? God. Jerseys? Guernseys? It's, it's a Holstein herd. Holstein? Yeah, and we're hanging on. We've got exactly the, the kind of numbers you're talking about. Um, but I, I've really been frustrated that folks from my own federal government have walked in and, and told my parents that they have extra property they don't need. Those, those are, the, uh, those are the, the people and yours are the family values that we proclaim in this country and that we want to uh, preserve. And I've seen the same uh, number of decline of family farms in the southern tier of my district as Exerbia has extended its rapacious hand north. And uh, dairy farms and, uh, and uh, and row crop farms, instead of pushing up soybeans and, and corn, are uh, uh, pushing up uh, pansies, daisies, and, and houses and lawns. Mm -hmm. um, Customs and Border Patrol used to be a very uh, friendly cooperative agency until it was assumed into the Department of Homeland Security, which I voted against. Didn't think we needed anything. I said it'll grow into a monster. It has. It started at a, collected a, a number of federal government agencies that were doing just fine on their own uh, into one big family. And once you do that, things become bigger. They started with 134,000. Now they're up to 215, 20,000 employees in this department. Uh, we've just approved funding for renovation of a facility for their headquarters. St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which I recommended to President Bush. I said it's the former home for the mentally disabled. This is a crazy idea. I think it needs to go there. Uh, but I'll just add to uh, your observation. Um, I was up in uh, Cook County, northeastern part of my district, a couple of years ago. Met with uh, the county sheriff to see how things are going on the border with Canada. We have the Pigeon River. Uh, and he said, I have to tell you this story. The uh, Customs and Border Patrol decided that they needed training 
on the northern border for their folks in Florida. And so they sent them up with a black helicopter. And they, uh, they landed up here in, in uh, Grand Marais, and then they went along 40 miles north to the border with Canada, and they were patrolling the Pigeon River, and they saw this conveyance crossing over from Canada. And when the, when the little canoe got on the U.S. shores, they swooped down on the intruders, put black masks over their heads and tied their hands behind their back and laid them down on the sand and aimed these uh, 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 vicious-looking weapons at them. All, all the while, these six people dressed in ominous black asked their names and called the names into the county sheriff who said, I won't repeat the exact words, but he said, you've just arrested the chief uh, of the Grand Portage Indian Band, who said to them, my people have been crossing over here for 2,000 years. If you don't want us to do it, just tell us. Don't aim guns at us. So you're a victim, there are other victims, and we'll do our very best to make sure that there are no further victims. Thank you. And Mr. that you get an appropriate apology. Thank you. I appreciate that immensely.